United Baptist Church. We are thankful that you've made it to the house of worship and invoke the blessing of the living God upon you as you share in this fellowship with us. And our prayer is that our God will so thrill you that you not only want to be present with us, but you might say to somebody else, as we say when we have a good meal, a good experience, come along and experience this with me. That there might be something about this day's service that causes you to do that. This is the fourth week that we spend in the book of Haggai. And we are all looking at being strengthened as a church. We define strength in biblical and not human ways. And then we went on to talk about how that we who are strengthened by God are actually strengthened in order that we may serve. And we do realize that that service is impossible to do if God is not availed to us. So we are strong, strong to serve, and serve in the strength availed to us by God. And we perpetuate that thought in the course of this hour. Because God's promise to us is that his spirit is present with us. And so if you're following our study with care, all that we are going towards, what I'm leading you towards, is to realize that church is no club. It's not just one of those things you do in life. It's not a by the way activity. Church is the evidence of God's presence in this world. Church is what carries God to every corner of the earth in visible form. For God himself has come to dwell in the lives of those who call themselves His. And surely that's not just another meeting, that's not just another activity, that is the all-embracing source of life and life itself. And if we do not realize that, we as yet know nothing about living for God the way He wants us to live. We know how wonderful it is to have the company of friends, all family, especially when we are miserable, at pain, sick, and they surround us. How many times do we hear on our radio, local radio, so and so died at the age of 89 in peace, surrounded by family and friends? There's something very consoling about the presence of family. It soothes, it comforts, it encourages. So when we are in pain, there is a certain sense of peace that comes. And it would be a delight. See the heart to which it takes us to just note we are in the presence of those who care. If human company can be good, how much more must the company of believers, better still of God be. I think of an instance in which, as high school teacher, I traveled with my boss and some medical workers to a place where the medical team only gave us a ride in their vehicle because we didn't have one in the school at the time that we could take to go and select grade eights who had qualified from grade seven into that grade. In the course of that journey, several stops were made. And my friends would go into the pubs, they would go into whatever places, but I would sit on the vehicle 
I carried my Bible and read it as many times as I was able to. I sometimes just contemplate it more. The visit over, we returned. Two weeks later, I meet this man who had been the head of a medical team and who had been observing me very keenly on that particular trip. And he greets me, how are you doing? I say, I'm good, my God is sustaining me. And he says, not that God business again. I said, why not? Then he reminded me of the trip we had undertaken. And he asked me this question. Who was the most lonely person on that trip? We had a good time as we went. But there you were, alone in your Bible. And we enjoyed ourselves. So I said, oh, is that the way he looked at it? He agreed. I said, all right, tell me, do you believe that God exists? He said, yeah. Do you believe that God created you? He said, yes. Okay. If you do, then hear me well. During those instances when you saw me alone, seemingly bold, while you yourselves had good company and enjoyed yourselves, I was actually enjoying the presence of your God. Now tell me, who had more and better company? I who had the creator, or you who had the created? He broke down and walked away. I have not seen him again. But how many of us realize this is who God is? He is more to us than our families. He is more to us than our friends. He is more to us than our nation. He is more to us than our world. He is more to us than the universe. He is more to us than all that. And it is this God who says to you and me, I am with you. My spirit is with you. Do we all appreciate that? Let's ask ourselves just a trio of questions. What spirit characterizes your life? Some of us are very moody. Others of us are shaped by environment. Whatever happens around us just carries us along with it. Still certain of us just don't even know where we stand. Today this hits us, tomorrow that hits us, the next day that. And so who are we, where are we, what are we up to? Our heads are shaking. But there are those of us who know also beyond any shadow of doubt that we don't owe our lives to ourselves, we owe our lives to God. And we say, living God, loving God, shape my life. I watched this young man called Patrick Chan. He has just won the figure skating championship of Canada about the tenth time and has beaten the record that any other figure skater in this country has. When he was asked what gives him success, he spoke of a very influential figure in his life who died some time back, who he thinks has his spirit looking down and smiling upon him. How many of you are seated here Think like that. The spirit of my mother, my grandmother, my whatever, whatever, that spirit is looking down upon me and smiling. That's why I have no good luck. Dream on. Enjoy your myth. If it's not God overseeing you, then your life is wasted. Yes, God may allow us some form of success, and our wild imagination can take us wherever we want. If the Spirit of God is not what characterizes our life, 
we are lost. Let's ask ourselves a question. What benefit has that spirit which has characterized your life brought into your life? What's been the product? You see, we have some among us who want to have the last word. See how we, some of us engage in arguments. And until we have the last word, we are uncomfortable because we must go out with a conviction. I did, did tell them. As one woman would say, after quarreling with some people in the neighborhood, I gave it all to them. Others of us amass wealth. And that's what keeps us going. I have possessions. I have material. Still others amongst us value just our happiness. Fun. As one person would say, I never miss a moment when I could have a laugh. Which is yours? But there are those who enter this world and say, God, if I'm not endowed by your spirit, and if he's not carrying me wherever I am, I'm worth nothing. Where are you? Will you Hear God when he gives this promise. My spirit is among you. Or will you go just the way you want to go? Our friends, we're just like ourselves. Not just what we read. God speaking to his people. Is the glory of the present house superior to the past house? Will your weaknesses simply continue to dominate you? Or will there be a different accent among you? Or we're just driving through town. In fact, my son was driving me at that particular time. When two young people emerged and just cr crossed the road, then he looked at me and said, You mean there are young people in Passboro? I said, Yes, sir. Because he hasn't seen them here. And think about how we are saying we are aging. And we know how we lost some of our older people. Others with a challenge of health and can't even make it. Numerous of them, when I've been to their house, they even said, See, I don't even have my envelope now. The person who used to bring them to church for me is still unwell and as unwell as me. And so now I just sit at home. We know that's a challenge we're faced with. We are an elderly set of people. And some of us begin to feel, Yeah, can anything come? Out to the Hasbro church, we will die and the doors will be closed. That's what these people are lamenting. We will, they could think of Solomon's temple. They could think of what had gone on below. And even when the foundation of the temple was laid, they looked at it and said, it can't match what we've done before. They are looking at their weaknesses. And they are getting discouraged. Are you getting discouraged? You look around, as somebody whispered, even as we're entering church this morning, where are the people? <laughs> See, where are the people? Where are they? You're here. It doesn't take any more than you who are here to grow this church. And what will it take? Each one of us, we're in the promise. God says, 
I am with you. Now the question is, how can we evidence the presence of God amongst us? We will begin by accepting his promise. For so he says, I am with you. As I was with you when you left Egypt. So I will be. You see, before I came on the scene, you were slaves. Before I came on the scene, you were powerless. Before I came on the scene, you were desperate. Before I came on the scene, you were destitute. My presence changed the scene. So you see, your sin, the situation for you became different at my appearance. Is God among us? Is God changing the sin for us? I believe he is. And if he would do that, let's accept his promise. I am. Am I? Can you sense his presence? We talked a lot about that last week in some measure. Anyway, can you, at a personal level, can you sense the presence? Don't just accept. To share your acceptance, adapt to the presence of that spirit within you. You see, I can say I'm your friend and yet refuse to be compatible with you. I can say you are my spouse and yet say, I will not conform to the pattern of marriage. I can say we are church mates, and yet say we will go our different ways. There must be an adaptation. Each one of us beginning to conform to the way that God says the church should conform. And what is that? We read from Psalm 111, Thy word have I hidden in my heart, I might not sin against you. How many of us have adopted that? I am reminded of an elderly pastor who had been invited to a church, to a function by one of the church members. There, a lady of just about half his age, you know, went over to talk to him. They had made a little at that church member's house. And she knew that this pastor was all by him, so she had never seen him in the company of his wife, even though he was married. And as they got on to the discussing something, in the middle of the function, she stopped, looked squarely in his face and said, Pastor, I have been celibate for many, many years since my husband and I divorced. And I've tried to keep myself as clean as possible. And then looking right into his eyes, she said, but now, I am ready for a relationship. The inference was clear. But that wise man looked into her face and said, Why are you telling me all that? You claim to be a Christian? Go and tell that to your God. She had never heard anything of the kind. And she said to, to her co-worker who had introduced her to that pastor, no man has ever spoken to me like that, the way your pastor did. I want to be like that pastor, for that is how I take God's presence into the community. I want to be that distinct figure that is not conforming to the way the world is, but is taking the way of God to the world. Will you be that? Thy word have I hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Ruth told us, area in the children's story, that if we are God's people, something will characterize our life. We will not be bitter with one another. Just think about it. We carry church wherever we are. You carry church by what you speak regarding your pastor, by what you speak regarding your deacon, by what you speak regarding your board members, by what you speak regarding the members of this church, by what you speak regarding the attendees, adherents, and sympathizers to this church. What do you carry to the community around? 
Why do you speak about each one of these souls present? Where did people hear you speak something nice about these people? Where did they hear you do that? I don't care how they live. No, you should care. Because the moment we say we are God's people, we are saying we are family. And the world around us knows what we think about each other. And so when we meet and are looking holy in a sitting like this, and yet when we go out we gossip badly about one another, we are not taking God to that world. Why? Even our God fully defends his own people. Because when Satan goes to God and says, see how bad they are, God says, I don't see anything bad in them. We may confront each other about the things that we know are not going right, but we dare not speak to the outside world what we should be confronting each other about and the bitterness we feel about each other, which should lay aside as we've been told, because the spiritual God is not bitter with any one of us, is actually wanting to bless each one of us so that we may be a blessing to each other. We will be that. I've just talked about our elderly people. Some of whom have home care, others don't. Certainly some of whom will be with us here if they have a right. I don't know how many of us would go out of our way and early in the morning or whatever time, just call one another. How are you doing? Did you want to ride? Did you do that? What do they think about me? It's not what do they think about me. It is what does my God want me to do. You see, there are certain of these uncomf seemingly uncomfortable things we need to do in order to reach out the onlooking world and so begin to show that God is going with us. The presence of God with us should come with us. As one man would say, I don't just have God when I'm in the four walls that building called church, which some of us and many of us mistakenly call church. I carry church with me when I'm in the kitchen washing my dishes. I carry church with me when I'm walking on the street and meeting people. I carry church with me when I'm in a meeting, in a political meeting, at a rally somewhere. I carry church with me wherever I am. That's what we need. God would have been in heaven and would have been unconverted and never brought to God. But he came to us and did not bring the world. He brought heaven to us. He brought his presence. He brought a change. That's what we need to take to our families. That's what we need to take to our friends. That's what we need to take to our community. That's what we need to take to this nation. Will the presence of God dominate your life? And let's sum it up in this simple saying. When Jesus is asked, show us that you are God's child. In John chapter 8, verse 46, Jesus answers with this remark. Which of you convinces me of sin? In our permissive society, will we go out and demonstrate that life that has no excuse for sin, but that lives above sin? Because God is with us. I trust you. Our Father, we return your thanks for the joy of knowing that your promise to us is that as we accept your presence amongst us, we might adapt to that presence. And as we adapt, dear Father, that we might attest to it by taking you to the world and being distinct in the world from the world for this very reason, that we might appeal to the onlooking world to come to the God we love and live for. <coughs> Give us this blessing, and we shall retain your thanks for it, even as we sum up our plea in the words our Saviour taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. 